My name is Jeff Walschlager. I am the VP of Composite Technology at Altair Engineering, and this is the short course on an introduction to multi-scale designer for continuous fiber reinforced material product forms. The short course involves three session videos. The first session video uh, was on multi-scale material model development using the forward process, and that session video should be completed before um, uh, performing the exercises in uh, this session video, which covers structural simulation using multi-scale material models. The third session video will cover multi-scale material model development using the inverse characterization process, which is just an alternate process to developing multi-scale material models um, than the forward process in the session one video. But let's continue with the uh, topic at hand, which is structural simulation using multi-scale material models. So multi-scale designer has two fundamental use cases. The first use case, which was covered in uh, the session one video, was the development of multi-scale material models. Uh, and you do that inside the multi-scale designer framework in the GUI uh, through the three-step process of developing a unit cell, characterizing your material linearly, and then characterizing your material nonlinearly. Um, the second use case of multi-scale designer is as a solver plugin. So using that developed multi-scale material model in any uh, structural FEA solver uh, of choice. So the idea is to apply multi-scale material models to any thermal mechanical structural simulation in any code, linear and or nonlinear, implicit and or explicit for any element type shell, solid shell, and or solid. Fundamentally, we want to have one material model for all solvers, for all solution sequences, for all element types. We shouldn't have to change out the material model because the solver, the solution sequence, or the element type changed. The solver, solution sequence, or element type should simply use whatever portion of the material model is required for that particular combination. And indeed, with multi-scale designer material models, that has become a reality. Multi-scale designer is a user material uh, plugin. Uh, so it is a user material DLL for all the solvers that we support. We do, of course, support our own structural FEA solvers, Objectruct and Radios, but we also support other third-party commercial solvers, uh, specifically Abacus, Dyna, and Ansys. And all of the solvers, uh, the Altair uh, ones and or the other third-party commercial solvers, uh, multi-scale designer plugin is a user-defined material. So what does the typical workflow look like? Um, step one, which was covered in, in uh, session one video, is uh, developing a multi-scale designer material model. Uh, and the output of that process was effectively uh, loading the database with a multi-scale designer material dat file, uh, which is known as an underscore MDS mat dot dat. Um, so you can have as many of these materials as you want in your uh, material database, uh, which in the case of multi-scale designer is a managed file folder system. Uh, that file folder system could be on a local drive or it could be on a shared network drive, all the same. Uh, but it's currently a managed uh, uh, file folder system. From the relative standpoint of the structural analyst who's building a model uh, in a structural simulation model in a uh, FEA preprocessor, We'll be using HyperWorks or HyperMesh. Um, very little changes uh, to the structural analysts in building the model. They'll simply make their model aware of the MDS mat.dat file by uh, including it into their uh, model via an assigned statement. You will create a material, uh, very much like creating any other material, uh, that simply points to that assigned statement. And then you'll assign that material to elements or, uh, or properties as needed. Um, so very little changes, as you'll see, to the uh, from the structural analyst viewpoint in using these material models. When we go to export that particular simulation to any uh, uh, FEA solver, OptiStruct and Radius are shown here, but it could be any third-party structural solver. Um, the uh, user-defined material plugin uh, is automatically loaded. And once that's automatically loaded, it knows how to interact with the MDS mat.dat file to get the information it needs automatically. So the process associated with actually solving these models is quite automated, uh, as I think you'll see. 
Okay, no better way to show the process than run an example problem. So we will run a linear and nonlinear analysis of a minus 45, 45, 2S uh, dog bone specimen in tension. I have three versions of this model, uh, all exactly the same, just three different uh, element type formulations. I have a uh, shell element formulation version of the model. I have a solid shell element formulation version of the model. And I have a solid ply-by-ply element um, formulation version of the model. Each of these versions has a start uh, model file from which uh, all of the model details have been defined except for uh, creating the material and assigning it uh, appropriately. So that is the exercise that we'll perform. I will do this on the shell and solid models um, because it covers uh, everything that uh, uh, needs to happen. Um, I'll leave the solid shell model as an exercise to yourself if so interested. Okay, so let's get started with our shell model. So we'll go ahead and open up our shell model under the start directory of the uh, uh, files that uh, should have been uh, given to you. You'll find the uh, shell underscore start dot HM. Uh, we can simply open that up and uh, we will uh, start through uh, our particular process. So the first process is to create an assign card. So we're going to go to our cards entity and we're going to create an assign. Uh, you can see this assign needs to be of type uh, MDS, MAD MDS. So if I scroll down the list here, I should see a, a MAD MDS type. I can give a variable name. Um, so we'll call this uni uh, since the it's a unidirectional material that we're working with. And I'm going to assign that variable name a file, uh, a file that it links to. And so the file that it links to is going to be under uh, Documents Multiscale Designer, which is where the default material library resides. Um, if you have changed your default material library, you'll just point to that particular directory. But when I go under My Documents Multiscale Designer, I can see all of my materials. I have quite a few materials. And in the session one video, we created a material called uni underscore forward. So if I Come down my list, I should see uni underscore forward here in my uh, material library. I simply click into that file. I can see that I have a mechanical um, uh, material model developed, which is what I want. If I go into that file uh, folder, I can see the underscore MDS mat dot dat, which is my material model. So I can simply click that file. And now I have the variable uni hooked up to that particular file reference. Okay, so it my model now knows about my material model file. Now I just need to create a material. So we'll call this carbon epoxy. Uh, and the card image uh, is going to be of type mat MDS. Uh, so if I scroll down my list, I should see mat MDS here. And I have an option a mat. It stands for assign material. So all I have to do here is give the variable of the assign uni and this material has been created. Um, so this material uh, now knows about the file through the variable uni. Okay, um, so now all I have to do is assign this material to various properties. In our case, we have a shell uh, model, so I'm going to use the composite browser. So if I go model composites, it will bring up the composite browser if it isn't already up. And I can expand my laminate that I've predefined, and you can see that there's no material assigned to all the plies of this particular laminate. So I'll go ahead and select all the plies, and then I will pick in the material column. And you can see it gives me a list of all materials that I've created. I only have one material, carbon epoxy. So that is my multi-scale designer, uh, multi-scale material. And so I'll pick that. And now that uh, carbon epoxy multi-scale material has been assigned to every ply. Um, and so that is it. Uh, I'm ready to go ahead and run this model. So we'll save this. Uh, we'll take off the start. And uh, we will go ahead and run it. So under Analyze, we will hit Run. Uh, it's going to export my model first. So I'm happy with the uh, file name. And we'll go ahead and export with all the default export settings. And then to run, um, to implement, uh, just to show that it is supported um, for uh, parallelism, you can say NT number of threads, say four. So I'll use uh, four cores here. Uh, and if I hit run, um, you'll see that OptiStruct will launch a full multi-scale simulation. You know that it's uh, picked up the multi-scale portion of the model correctly if you see the start 
and end of the reading of the multi-scale designer material data file MDS mat dot dat. Indeed, you can see that uh, here. The uh, multi-scale nonlinear uh, solution is, is off and running. Okay, so the solution has completed. Um, we can go ahead and close out. Oh, we can go ahead and, uh, it's completed now. We can go ahead and close out our uh, uh, solver window. Um, and we can come back to our um, uh, FEA preprocessor and go into the post-processor. I just put my post-processor on the second page of HyperWorks uh, Hyperview. We'll go ahead and load in uh, or open up our results model, which in the case of OptiStruct will be an H3D file. And when I uh, load in my results file, what I will see different um, than a, uh, because of a multi-scale material model, then a homogenized material model is under results scalars, you will see the MADMDS results now. Uh, and so under there, you'll see that there are matrix uh, results and there are uh, fiber results. So let's start by looking at the fiber results. So I can uh, click on the, the fiber strain. Right now, um, it's a shell model. So I believe it defaults to the maximum of all plies, but we probably want to look at an individual ply. So let's look at ply one. Um, and you can see ply one was a minus 45 and you can see that clearly the uh, fiber strain is going off at a minus 45 direction. Um, this is the linear solution sequence. So we'll start with the linear uh, solution first. If I went to uh, ply two, um, you would just see that it, it goes to the 45. So everything uh, looks right. And these are the strains in the fiber phase of that particular uh, ply. Let's go back to uh, ply one. And um, let's go ahead now and look at the matrix shear strain. This is a plus minus 45. So I'm probably interested in the shear strain in the matrix, which is constant in the gauge section, which is what you'd expect uh, for a dog bone. Um, and this is the shear strain in the matrix phase of every single ply. And of course, if I looked at ply two, it would just be the negative of this. So it should just be minus uh, uh, 25, um, 025, which indeed it is. Um, so that is the linear. I could flip over to the nonlinear run, um, which simply is a, a, a transient run. So I can uh, flip over to that. Uh, and one of the differences in the nonlinear run is we can look at the plastic strain in the matrix. So let's take a look at the plastic strain. Um, and we will start at, here we go, at, uh, and we'll look at the plastic strain imply one. Uh, we'll start at a time of zero. And as we go forward, you can see there's no plastic strain for a while. And then at some point, the plastic strain will pick up at some load around 50% of the load, the plastic strain picks up and then uh, continues forward all the way through. Um, so the full nonlinear capability um, of this particular uh, solution. You'll also see that the fiber strain um, is now different um, than what it was before because some of the load has been shed to the fibers due to the plastic strain uh, in the matrix. So the fiber strain now is quite a bit higher than the linear run uh, itself, just showing that the full nonlinear run uh, was actually, um, actually solved and that you can look at each constituent phase uh, separately. Okay. So let's uh, do this exercise again, but let's do it on the solid model instead of the shell model. And you'll see that uh, largely the process is completely unchanged uh, because the uh, element type uh, changed. I already showed the, uh, that nothing changed between a linear run and a nonlinear run. Um, and now we'll just show that nothing changes because of the, the element type. So we'll start with the solid uh, underscore start dot, dot HM. And this is just a, uh, ply by ply model uh, of the exact same uh, minus 45, 45, two symmetric uh, laminate of the dog bone. Um, and we're going to do the same process. We're going to go ahead and create our assign. It's going to be of type uh, mat MDS. We'll give it a variable name uni, and we will point to that same file we had before. We'll then create a material, carbon epoxy, or whatever name 
uh, so interests you. Uh, it'll be of type mat MDS, and we will reference that uni variable uh, in my materials been created. And then since it's a solid model, the plies are modeled with P solid properties. So I can uh, look at any property. You can see that no material is assigned to this property. I can just select them all because I want to apply the same material. And we will apply our, our carbon epoxy to, uh, to all the materials. And that's it. Um, that's all I have to do now. Um, this became a multi-scale material model. So let's go ahead and save that. And we can go ahead and run this model. And we'll run it again with four cores, just to show that it's fully paralyzed. And again, it's off and running. And how do you know that it's hooked up to multi-scale? You can see the start and end of the uh, mdsmat.dat file. Okay, and the analysis is complete now. So we can close out our solver window again. And we can go over to our post-processing uh, on our second page, and we can load up the results of the solid model now. So it'll be the H3D uh, solid. And uh, you'll see nothing different here from the shell model. Um, again, under results, uh, you'll see under scalars, the MAD MDS uh, results. Uh, I can um, look at the, uh, we're in the linear run here. Um, so I can look at the matrix shear uh, strains and you can see the uh, plus or minus nature of the shear strains and the minus 45, 45 plies uh, specifically. I can look at the uh, fiber strain um, and you can see here the top one is the minus 45. If I wanted to um, look at the, um, the next ply down, I could just take off that particular ply. So there's the uh, 45, uh, there's another minus 45 and so on. Um, so I could just peel off the solid layers if I uh, put each layer into a component appropriately. Um, and if I wanted to switch over to the nonlinear solution, uh, again, I can uh, look at the uh, plastic strains now in the matrix. So the equivalent plastic strain, um, we'll just load in all of the results here. We'll make it a transient. There we go. So if I go back to uh, step one and as I go forward, you can see no plastic strain, no plastic strain. And then at some load, somewhere around 0.5, it starts to build up plastic strain. Uh, in the matrix phase. Um, and then I could, you know, look at what's going on in the fiber, in the nonlinear, um, and that will be, um, shed a little bit of load uh, to the, um, uh, to the fibers because the matrix plasticity uh, has happened. So the ability to dive into each phase of, of each element. So each element contains a matrix and a fiber a phase and to be able to get the results in each of those phases and uh, uh, appropriately assess uh, what's going on uh, with the predictive nature of these particular materials. Okay, with that, I wanted to thank you very much. Um, that concludes uh, this session video. Uh, there will be one additional uh, video, uh, session three, which is going to cover multi-scale material model development using the inverse characterization process. Thank you. Thank you.